Well, we're about three months past the winter solstice, the darkest day of the year, when Chet happened to be born, for those of you who don't know that. <laughs> and in the old days, uh, people noticed that it kept getting darker and darker and darker, and there was the thought that the world is going to end because it's gonna, the sun is going to get extinguished. Well, if you've been checking out the uh, sun for the past three weeks, it actually is not getting any darker. So I guess that means we're safe. The world will not end this year. And we have another whole year to do things that would be beneficial for us. It seems strange that we kind of mark the year at the, you know, starting at the darkest day, but that's probably some of the reason behind it is, yeah, we're not going to die. So now we have another year. Now what are we going to do with it? And I thought it would be appropriate to take a look at the nation of Israel when they were on the brink of another whole new aspect of their lives. God had delivered them out of Egypt, um, had brought them to Mount Sinai, gave them the Ten Commandments, brought them to the brink of the Promised Land and said, okay, go get it. And they said, no way. And he said, okay, go in the desert and die. And the new generation rose up, and Moses is about to die, and he gives his farewell address to them. It's the book of Deuteronomy. And he reminds them of the stuff that they need to know to get the most out of their upcoming uh, events. And I thought, well, if we could have God come and ask him anything about what's going to happen this year, what would you want to ask him? Uh, you know, where's the market going to be at the end of the year? When is oil going to turn around? Or, you know, <laughs> who's going to win the next election? Um, I think the best question to ask is, God, how can I most be blessed by you this year? How can I experience the blessings that you want to give me? And the book of Deuteronomy is actually God telling Moses to tell the people what they need to do in order to be blessed. This is right before chapter 5, which is the second giving of the Ten Commandments. And it's before chapter 6, which is the Great Shema. And it comes after chapter 3. It's amazing how those numbers work. In chapter 3, Moses kind of reviewed how God... It's a really great chapter. Uh, we can kind of skip over it. But it's how God just destroyed like 60 walled cities and countless villages for this group of people before he even got them in to the promised land. So he'd been blessing them and he called us back to mind, look what God did for you. You guys should not have been able to win against those odds, yet I destroyed them all, even the biggest giants, and I gave them your cities. Now I got more stuff for you, and here's what you have to do in order to get it as we face this coming year. What do we have to do to get God's blessing? These are God's words about what he wants to tell us in order to get blessed. So it starts with Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1. Now, Israel, listen to the statutes and judgments which I teach you to observe or do or accomplish, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you. God is giving it to them, but in order for them to enjoy it and receive it, actually receive it and enjoy it, they've got to do something. Similarly, God has stuff for us this year. He wants to give us things that are delighting us, but in order to receive them, we have to be able to uh, do what he says. So the first thing I see here is listen. And Moses is teaching them so they can observe them, do them, accomplish them. It's not just a random list of stuff. It's stuff that we're supposed to actually apply to our lives. The purpose is so that we can really live. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. And that abundant life is basically go possessing the stuff that he gives us. You understand that? He gives us the stuff, but in order to be able to have it and enjoy it, receive it, you have to listen to what he says and do it. He says very clearly, do not add to the words which I command you, nor take away. All right? He said what he meant and meant what he said. An elephant has, well, anyway. Um, so these things are such that we are supposed to be able to keep or guard. This phrase, if uh, you're familiar with this, shows up a number of times in the chapter. And it's really, you're, you're, you're holding it, you're possessing it, you're putting it in your safety deposit box, you're standing guard over it. What's the thing that we're supposed to guard, you know, so treasure so carefully? The commands imperatives, the things that I command you. And he's doing this for our benefit. All right? This is the biggie. God does not do this so we'll have a miserable time. He wants to bless us. So that's 
the piece that we're going into this passage with understanding. God gives us the commands not to ruin our lives, but to bless us. He then goes back to a very strange, not, I'm sorry, strange, Baal Peor, means the mountain or something of Baal. It's in Numbers 25. Um, this is a low point in Israel's history at this point. They had uh, come up to, the second generation is on their way to the promised land. They had a lot of victory. And then the uh, young ladies of uh, Midian invited the Israelites to worship. And most of you know pagan worship, very sensual. Um, it's uh, opposed to Yahweh worship, which is very cognitive. And, and the people fell into sin. And this is where Phineas comes in and earns his covenant of peace by pinning a fornicating couple to the ground with his spear. One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament. <laughs> but uh, God honored him for taking that action. And Moses appeals to that. You guys saw what the Lord did about Peor. He smote and killed all the people. He destroyed them. God destroyed them directly. Phineas tell you can. Uh, all the men who followed Baal of Peor. If you follow an other God rather than the Creator God, you are just lining yourself up to get skewered. It you know, might not be in the same context, but God will destroy his people. These are his people, the people he loved, he redeemed. Yet a message that most people miss, even because they don't read the Old Testament, is God requires holiness among his people. And the people who held fast to the Lord who said, I'm not going to go to church with those folks, um, are alive today. All the ones who follow Baal Peor, dead. So he reminds them, ooh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, all those guys, they're not here, they're gone. And God wants loyalty to himself above all else. So just remember, the commands were for people's benefit. Had the people obeyed and not followed Baal Peor, there would have been more of them that day. But because they went off and followed their you know, passions and lust and desires, uh, God killed them. The next thing he says is, Surely I have taught you statutes and judgment. One of these days you just kind of look those up and figure out what the difference is. No biggie. Um, just as the Lord your God commanded me. So God commanded Moses to teach. He didn't just command him to say, Moses, send the people this, you know, this information. You know, put on a big tablet so they can see it and, you know, that, uh, you know, maybe highlight it with, you know, stuff. He basically caused them to learn it, is the word for teach. So Moses was commanded to teach so that they would not act incorrectly, but act according to what God commanded in the land which they go to possess. All right, so teaching is supposed to eventually affect your lives. It's not an intellectual head experience. It's designed to affect how you live. So when a temptation comes up, you say, ah, it's not worth it. Therefore, be on guard, be careful. All right, that's that same, that same phrase there. To observe or do them. For this is your wisdom and understanding in the sight of the people. Obedience is the basis of our wisdom and witness. And we're also going to see in a minute, worship. Obedience is good. That's why Jesus said, if you love me, obey me. Um, so if you carefully guard yourself from straying from the truth, so that you obey the truth, then you'll be smarter in the eyes of others. Most uh, problems people have is because they abandon the scriptures. And this concern for obedience, like, is supposed to be a witness to those under that this is a wise and understanding people. If you look at the things that people tend to focus on, it's like, is, is there a head covering or is there not a head covering? You know, do you worship on this day or that day? And somehow the world is not impressed with that kind of stuff. Do you dip people or do you sprinkle people? Do you dunk people? You know, it's like, you know, when you have the Lord's Supper, does you use wine or grape juice? You know, that's not our wisdom. Um, but people living according to the truth should be attractive to others. They might not agree with us, but they should respect us. And that was God's plan that this nation 
would reflect positively, what great nation is there a God who's so near to it, Lord of God, that for every reason we may call upon him? Whatever reason. This is like Philippians. And, and nothing be anxious, but in everything. God delights in having us call upon him and answering our prayers. And that's what we praise God for every Sunday. Um, whatever reason, God's there. Well, God, need help. I got this list of stuff. I'm concerned about it. What do you want me to do? Is there anything I can do? I can trust in you. And anything else you want me to do? If there's nothing else to do, then trust that God will work it out according to what is best. It will reduce anxiety significantly. Um, and what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments which are all in the law which I said before you today? Uh, the, some people are embarrassed about the fact that you know, Christianity or Judeo-Christianity has restrictions on people. We don't want to blame them down, but actually therefore are good. So here's the worship part. I don't know if you saw it down there. Oops, I've got to do this guy again. Um, this is part of worship. We can call upon God. That's the, the worship piece. So we got wisdom, we got witness, we got worship, and it's all rooted in this little thing called obedience, and he's going to remind them of it when he starts giving them the Ten Commandments all over again. Any questions on A and B? Some of you have had, been exposed to this before. Okay, only be on guard and take heed. Wait, we heard those words before? Yeah, I think so. Um, it seems to be a major theme here. Uh, be on guard, take heed to yourself. Two different things. And this is repeated in the New Testament a number of times. And people who fail to take heed to themselves to reflect, okay, how am I doing according to God's word? And I encourage you in a sermon uh, via video the previous week to reflect on uh, how you're doing. So you can diligently keep or preserve your soul. If we're diligently taking heed to ourselves, we will not forget the God's law. Uh, they will not depart from our heart, our decisions. That's where Hebrews made their decisions. Put a little heart there. That the heart was where they made the decisions. At the core of where your decisions are, the value system is God's word, God's glory, God's way, not the world's way. And people who fail to be on guard, basically the word departs from their heart and their life is empty. Uh, as we're coming back from the airport, uh, Chad and I were having a discussion, and I had made the comment that um, people in general, and it's my exposure every time I you know, go outside BAC circles, don't uh, have a real sensitivity to God and His Spirit. They, they, they just don't understand His Word. They, they don't follow it. Uh, they're not Spirit-led. Uh, they have don't have insight and understanding to God's ways, and there, there's a lot of stuff like that. So Chad was asking, you know, question trying to find the bright line between uh, people who do and don't get, uh, follow God. And he had brought up, rightly so, a number of you know, typical character flaws and perfections of the human experience to see if that was the thing, you know, people who have their act together and don't do that stuff, are, are they the ones who are, have this closer relationship with God or is it something else? And I was arguing for the fact that it's really not the little behaviors you know, the, the sins that uh, easily entangle us, that, that's not the stuff. At, at the core of our being, the thing that drives us and motivates us has to be the glory of God, His values, His purposes for our lives. If, if that is the core of what you want to do, the other stuff falls into place. You know, David. David, you know, adultery and murder, you know, a bunch of other things that probably weren't too swift. Uh, we probably a lot of people in modern churches looking at it and go, oh, whoa, those are bad. And yeah, they are. You know, it's not a good idea. But he was a man after God's heart. He wanted God's glory. And that was seen pretty early in his life. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine defying the armies of the living God? Give me my sling. Let me at him. And he slew Goliath. When Jesus walked in, through the earth, uh, people being willing to deny themselves to follow him those are the people that had the relationship with him. And today it's no different. The people who um, value God more than anything that this world has to offer are the ones who have the great relationship with God. They're the ones to whom God uh, is intimate. So be on guard, take heed to yourself.
diligently, look at all these words, keep or preserve your soul, lest you forget, lest they depart. And the best way to prevent that from happening, after be on guard, diligently reserve, don't forget, don't let them depart, teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. Passing on truth to others is the best way to keep you in the truth, which is why our motto is learn the truth, live the truth, and love others with the truth. If you're doing that, this loving others with the truth constantly reinforces the learn and live. That's the way God designed it. It's not just, you learn it so you know it. It's like, well, I, I know all about God. No, it's, if you're not passing it on to others, it's worthless. Well, not totally worthless. It'll keep you out of some trouble. But the God's goal is that it gets passed on to others, and if you're doing that, it's much more likely to stick in your life. Uh, I was fortunate that I had some opportunities very early after I had learned stuff to pass it on to others. I was a teaching assistant. And as a result, I learned this stuff so much better. And I got it ingrained. And uh, Chet and I were talking about, he's going to be putting together a course, and we talked about when I was putting together a course back in seminary. And putting this stuff together so you can pass it on to others is, is such a valuable experience for keeping it uh, in the forefront of your thinking. If you keep it in the forefront of your thinking, you tend to obey it a whole lot more. Now, he especially wants them to uh, pass on events concerning the day you stood before your God in Horeb, another word for Mount Sinai, when the Ten Commandments came. And this is when the Lord said to Moses, gather all the people to me and I will let them hear my words. So, they can know what the Ten Commandments are. Recite them. Maybe even recite them backwards. No, that they might learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. So what's the key thing in here? Uh, unfortunately, the way it's broken up doesn't show exactly. There it is, right there. So we can draw spirals, all right? Ooh, all right. <laughs> The world's wisest man said, okay, I've considered everything there is to do under the sun. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And as uh, some of you know, when, when my first church experience, for pastor at church in Chinatown, I, I was, you know, I mentioned fearing God, and I got this overwhelmingly, oh, you're not supposed to fear God, you're supposed to love him. So I said, okay, let's see what the scriptures say. So I went through and I printed out all the verses that say fear God, all the verses that say you're supposed to love God. And actually, if you understand love, you fear him because that's in, in the context of loving him, he says fear him. And fear outnumbered love. So that is God's, you know, he wants this relationship with us, but it's got to be based on the fact that he is God and we are not. He is awesome, we are not. Despite how wonderful we think of ourselves, we're not God, and we try to live our lives like, oh, well, I'm a, it's only me that I have to be accountable to. No, we have to be accountable to God. So if you notice, this concept of fearing him is something that needs to be learned to fear him, and it never stops. You never take your relationship with God for granted. We're going to see Moses kind of actually messed up on that one. But if you hear and you fear, which means you obey, then you are in a position to teach, that they may, may teach. See that connection? So why is there no teaching going on? The first thing I would look for is, is there really a fear and obedience of God, a concern uh, for what God thinks about our actions? Um, righteousness is doing what's right in his sight. Fear of God is being careful to do what's right in his sight. It's awareness that the God who judges is watching and remembering everything I think, do, and say. And we will have to give an account for even idle words. So you want to make sure that you have something to say when God says, why did you say that? Um, so be purposeful in your speech. He reminds them further of the day, then you came near, you stood at the foot of the mountain, the mountain burned with fire to the midst of heaven, it was darkness and cloud and thick darkness. The earth was shaking, and the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound. You saw no form. You only heard a voice. Therefore, don't make any forms. That's what he's going to say next. 
So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. Ooh, God cares about performance. We should evaluate our performance. We should videotape our day in our minds and go back and replay it. Uh, even secular people can do this. Ben Franklin used to keep a little ledger journal thing and uh, in his pocket. And uh, whenever he would do or say something that he knew he would regret, he would make a black mark in the journal. And at the end of the day, he would go back and replay each of those black marks and realize, oops, shouldn't do that. And he turned into a wonderful statesman through that process. And he just did it with a little black mark. You, know, you can record it on your phone. <laughs> um, and he, he replayed the stuff. So God appeals to their experience where like, they were overwhelmed. They feared God at the mountain. I mean, they feared him so much they said to Moses, uh, Moses, like, you go and talk to him. We, we, we don't want you. Tell us whatever he says we'll come do. But like, ah, it's God saying, he's going to kill us. Um, there, there was this awesome response to God's revelation. Let me see if I have this next one. Yeah, all right, we'll do the next Okay, any questions on that? Hear the words, learn to fear, teach them to others. Yes? Is, so, caring about glorifying God should be motivating our thoughts and our awareness fear fit into glory? Is it part of being glory to God? Yeah, the question is, where does fear fit into glorifying God? Is it part of it? Yeah, if the big thing is, notice he hasn't even said glorify him yet, but to fear him is to recognize him as the awesome God who's worthy of obedience. And that shows that he is, that's part of glorifying him. He, he's, he's not a God to be trifled with. He's not a God to be ignored. He's not the cosmic bellhop or the cosmic teddy bear who'll just comfort you when you get a boo-boo or get you whatever you want. He is an awesome God. I, I love that song, by the way, uh, particularly a bit about putting on the Ritz when he rolled up his sleeves. The thunder in his hands. I mean, that, that is the God of the Old Testament. Uh, and I'm glad that someone managed to get that into our hymnology uh, because it's the right view of God. Whenever I listen to hymns or songs, I'm always thinking, how does that relate to the scriptures? And we, we visited different another church and I'm lis listening to the words as I'm singing them and I'm realizing this is not based on the scripture. This is not the God of the scriptures. This is, this is not you know, really food that people can live on. But uh, things that accurately reflect God uh, are things that you can live on. Oh, no, I did it again. Wait, but I know there's this, this one? Uh, almost, and then we got the minibar. First one or second one? First. Thank you. Yes. Another evil Microsoft product. <laughs> All right. Okay. Responding to revelation guards against vain or false worship. Our world is full of vain and false worship worship, and I'm talking about the religious world. I heard a line in a church I recently visited. When we worship God, he teaches us. This is in a church service where the majority of the service was given to uh, a rock concert, and the smaller part of the service was, service was given to the Word of God. And when the pastor got up to preach, he said, oh yeah, when we respond you know, when we worship God, then he teaches us. And I'm thinking, no, 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 that, 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 there's something wrong with that. It's backwards. Because their worship is supposed to be a response to revelation. Their conception of worship was, I feel certain things. I, I just kind of was watching the people in front of me, and uh, I just, you know, just took the, the, the actions that I'm seeing, took out the sound, and realized, this is a rock concert. You know, people are there with their, you know, boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife, and they're just having this grand experience singing. And God, the words didn't match, the actions didn't match, there, there's something that this just was not going on right. And they were having an emotional response to music that had no theological content. And then the, they say, when we, when we respond to this thing, then God teaches us. Other way around. God reveals himself to us. We respond to that. And you know, Bill Gothard had recommended that we basically put the, all the singing and songs at the end of the sermon um, because that's a, a response to what God has revealed in his truth. 
our worship and everything needs to be based on what the truth says. So one of the things we are starting to do in our Roman study is I encourage people, when you're coming up with your outline that basically indicates your understanding of the passage, work directly off the text, the words of the scripture. So you're not going to deviate from it. And then when you get it in a little more, you can synthesize into something else. But we want everything that we are thinking about God and his word to come directly from the scripture. Failure to do that will wind up in false worship. Jesus said, you know, in vain do they worship me. Because they're teaching as the commands of God, the mere stuff of men. So Moses says, the Lord commanded me to teach you Statutes and judgments for the purpose of doing them in the land which you cross over to possess. Therefore, be on guard, take careful heed. We've heard that before. Same thing. To yourselves. Now, you didn't see any form when the Lord spoke, so don't make any figure that looks like God. And he goes through it, you know, like every exception. And I'm thinking, as I'm, you know, I try to read things I've never seen it before. And I'm thinking, okay, he, he's left out fish, you know, and I can do fish. And then, then we get something, you know, in the, in the water. All right, oh, you got that. So, you know, it's like nothing, nothing, nothing. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember having, we were up in Willow Weemock, uh, in a place in the Catskills. Uh, I hired a guy who was a Greek Orthodox priest uh, to help us plant. And because uh, he really liked working in the land, and we are talking about icons, and we go visit him in his house, and he's got all these icons, pictures of saints and everything around. And uh, they go in and you know they, they kiss him just like the Jews do with the Torah. You know, it's, and uh, I the next day when we were planting, I made some references. Oh, we don't you know uh, worship them; we just venerate them. I'm thinking, wait a minute. As far as I know, in the English language, worship and venerate are two pretty similar things. Uh, they remind us of people. Well, God said, don't do that. Uh, one of the major things that has you know, crept into Christianity is people want visual representations. Do you realize that God could have given a visual representation of himself if he so chose to do it? But he didn't want that to happen. He, he had this quaking mountain with the you know, shaking and the burning and the fire and the you know, it's like a volcano. And he didn't give us a picture of him on his throne. He didn't give us a picture of him, you know, with radiating glory. You know, no cherubs were around that day. Now, of all the ways that God could have chose to communicate at this pinnacle uh -huh, point of revelation, what did he choose to do? Words. Not images. I realize this goes against the grain of our culture, but, you know, so what's new? Um, so you need to understand that Christianity, Judeo-Christianity, is a cognitive thing. And it's the cognition, the understanding of what God has revealed. He said, I'm going to exalt above all things my name and my word. The word is going to be there forever. So the word is so crucial. Don't bring it into human experience as an idol. And I find this really interesting, this next little phrase, take heed, oh, there's, I should have done that, here's that, I think that's the word again, lest you lift your eyes to heaven when you see the sun, moon, stars, all the host of heaven, and you feel driven to worship them. You download a Google star map on your phone. <laughs> no, it's okay, you can use a Google star map to be able to name them. But it, I find it interesting that you're in the presence of some created thing and you're kind of overwhelmed by it. You're in the presence of great music or great art and you basically want to worship it. Now, someone here is a friend who said, the Metropolitan the, uh, MoMA is my church. And when I went into MoMA, I mean, last time I did, I was remembering this line. I'm thinking, this guy is worshiping Satan. <laughs> you know, all the you know, demonic stuff that's there, that's his church. But the person felt driven to worship that and to serve them. Serve them means you arrange all your life and schedule around these things. God wants our worship of him to be on the truth that he's revealed, not on any of the created things. Any question? Yeah? We were just doing discipleship and it's the worship God in spirit and truth in John 4. Do you want to touch anything on the spirit? Or like sure. 
So uh, John Four is the conversation uh, with the woman at the water cooler, or woman at the well. And um, she is basically saying what brings the issue to, well, we worship here and you worship there and stuff like that. And you must worship God in spirit and truth because such the Father seeks to worship him. She had the idea of spirit. I think it's a human spirit rather than a, a for, for her, context. It was not the Holy Spirit. Uh, we would extend that in Christianity to the Holy Spirit. There is an emotional component to worshiping God, but it's got to be based on truth. And a major, major, major flaw, this is why the whole Northern Kingdom got demolished, is they were doing their worship, but not in the spot God required, which happened to be Jerusalem. It had to be based on truth. So the pagans worship in spirit. They, they, they dance, they'll cut themselves, they, you know, they go all out, but it's not according to truth. And I think what Jesus is doing there is say it, it, it's both. There's got to be an emotional component. David's worship in the Psalms, you know, people don't understand the Psalms, not this particular group, but by and large, if you, God gave us this 150 chapters, why is that the biggest one? You know, why is that book so big? And it's basically David's responding to God's revelation. I was in trouble, I called to God, he helped me. But it, what's the biggest <clears throat> chapter of the biggest book in the Bible? Psalm 119. What is Psalm 119 all about? God's revelation in truth, the word. All right, so that's the thing that's got to take preeminence. And David had great emotional response to God because he trusted the word and God came through. And then he had the emotions that glorified God. Um, I had a couple conversations then in Panama with some folks uh, about this topic. And uh, the thing that I always go back to is I teach, I taught courses on the origin of all civilizations. I've looked at how every civilization arose, how their culture came about, how their worship came about. And there is pagan worship and there is Yahweh worship. And to make the point really clear, much of what passes for modern worship today is no different than Hitler's mass meetings. I remember when some people went out to uh, the Midwest to a church they told me about, there's a guy who was going to plant a church out there. And he said, you know, well, first we got to get the banners waving. And then we got to get the music working. Then we have to have the spirit swaying, you know. And then we'll get into the, 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 you know, the, the, the teaching. And what Hitler said, they had the banners, the trumpets, the songs, everything that you would have in a modern worship service. They had all that. And Hitler says, people will come to those meetings having no thought whatsoever about being a Nazi and they will leave firmly committed to it. Aristotle said the way you persuade people, this is classic rhetoric, is you first get the emotions moving in the direction that you want, and then you give them logical reasons to keep, you feed them logical reasons to keep them moving in the direction that their emotions have taken them. And uh, William Shakespeare, you might have heard of him, some, some playwright from a while ago, in his uh, play Julius Caesar, some of you remember the lines, friends, Romans, and countrymen, let me your ears. And, you know, joke, he's got a sack of ears. Um, I come not to praise Caesar, but to bury him. He actually follows classic Greek rhetoric in getting the people's emotions riled up and then having them move in the correct direction. That is not worship according to the Spirit of God. That is worship according to the psychology of man. And that kind of stuff doesn't wind up in God getting glorified. The reason that this fear of God and focus on his truth is so crucial if we want to experience his blessing is even Moses, the main man, the most humble man on earth, the, the guy who like left all the treasures of Egypt, he would have been God on earth. You know, being Pharaoh was God on earth. Moses said, uh-uh, I consider the reward of Christ to be greater than all this, even though I'm going to suffer with a bunch of sheep for a while. Even Moses missed out on blessing because of imperfect obedience. God said, speak to the rock. Moses struck the rock. And it's not just a matter of semantics or quibbling about words. <laughs> it's he lost out. And he, he, in the previous chapter, he actually talked about, I, I 
pleaded with the Lord to let me go in. This, this great land that you know, I've been waiting 80 years for. And God says, uh-uh. Now, Moses did not lose his salvation, but he did not get into the promised land. Most of you know that that is a great passage to understand the difference between justification and glorification. He's out of Egypt. He's God's servant. But he tripped at the finish line. And God said, I don't play favorites. You, know, you, you did not do what I said. You lose. So he'll see it in the kingdom, but he lost. Moses also does a little blaming here. I, I find this kind of amusing. He said, uh, the Lord has taken you out, brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be his people, an inheritance as you are this day. Most of us, I think, start our Christian life just glad to be out of what we were. And then we forget what we were. And we doubt. And we rewrite history. They don't just do that in history books. They, people do it in their own lives. But remember where you were before God found you and you found him. He has delivered you out of that. But he is, I mean, the, I think the imagery is great. I mean, you, I, you couldn't have planned it better. He brings them out and takes care of them in a desert place. He sustained them. But that's not the Christian experience that God has in store for you. He wants to bring you into the abundant life and then the eternal life. So the Lord brought you out. But furthermore, the Lord was angry with me. He's, he's your number one man. How could you be angry with him? Look what he put up with. And God said, uh-uh. And swore. Oh, God swore. <laughs> Who does he swear by? Buddha? Yeah, you know. <laughs> Buddha. No, anyway. Um, I swore that and said, I would not cross over the Jordan. I would not enter the good land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. But I must die in the land, pouty face. Um, I must not cross over the, the Jordan, but you shall cross over and possess that good land. So if Moses missed out for disobedience, what do you think will happen when we disobey? When we don't do what God does, when we doubt him? You know, another bright line for people between people who have an like, uh, you know, intimate relationship with God and people who don't is the ones who trust him have a good relationship, the ones who doubt him, don't. I know it's like uh, axiomatic. Whatever that word means, it sounds like a good one. Ah, I did it again. Okay, we're getting there. Okay, any questions on Moses? You gonna see him in heaven? Did he make it into the promised land? Nope, lost his reward. Was Paul concerned about losing his reward? Yup. Should you be concerned about losing your reward? Yup. How do you avoid losing your reward? Be careful to obey what God has said. You can't obey it if you don't know what he said. Ignorance is not bliss. <laughs> yeah? Question about Moses. Um, I do assume his eternal uh, reward will be quite large given that he did obey everything else. So that's why. Like... Yeah. I think Moses is going to be sitting pretty well in the future kingdom. You mentioned David earlier. So David then sinned and he said, to murder. Yet still then seemed to get blessed. So like, what happened in that case? Um, the adultery murder resulted in David's family being split apart. Lots of heartbreak with Absalom. He reaped consequences from his actions. As Paul said in Galatians, hey, God is not mocked. You will reap what you sow. So David reaped negative consequences. Lots of heartbreak, lots of pain, um, because God had promised he would be the branch from his, I mean, descendant would come from uh, the root of his father, Jesse. Uh, he, he will still be there doing well in the kingdom. But the, the amount of trauma he experienced as a result was heart wrenching for him. So sin is never worth it. It just, you know. It, it, and it was so, it just showed how David had kind of gradually moved away from living dependently upon God. It's another great line between those who have good relationship with God and those who don't. Uh, the ones who depend on him versus the ones who live independently of him. And, and God said to David, David, you know, I gave you all the stuff. I would have even given you more. You know, if you wanted whatever Bathsheba was, or, you know, I would have given you one of those. But... <laughs> but... David didn't trust God to meet his needs. He went and did it himself, and he lost 
and his family lost, and it's just a sad story. The guy who could fight Goliath gets tripped up by a woman. Oh, that happened to Solomon as well, <laughs> remember? What tripped up Solomon? Not having a quiet time, but women. That's all my best friends are women. Okay, so, um, poor Moses, poor David, poor us. Okay, let's move on. God is both jealous and merciful. Therefore, take advantage of him. No. <laughs> Fear him, all right? So, be on guard, take heed. Boy, that's sounding vaguely familiar. Maybe it's the title, you know, be on guard and go for the glory. Yeah, be on guard, take heed. Do this in your quiet time every morning. God, see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of light of everlasting. Search me, try me. Open my eyes. So I don't be an idiot. Be on guard, take heed, lest you forget the covenant of your God. He actually just said that earlier. I remember that. Uh, which he made with you. And make for yourself a carved image, blah, blah, blah. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. The New Testament quotes this about God as well. So I guess he didn't change. <laughs> Consuming fire. Uh, it's interesting, he appears as a fire on Mount Sinai, he appeared to Moses as a fire, he comes back, fire is going to come out of his mouth, you know, it's like the original torch guy. Um, actually, yeah. You don't want to take him for granted because he will consume you. He's jealous, he, does, he, he wants your worship, he wants your heart. One of the things that's really interesting when I used to do with my students is when we looked at Caesar Augustus and uh, the fact that he banned adultery and we had the students discussing whether adultery was a good or bad thing, uh, I was uh, taken a little bit aback by the amount of passion that was expressed by some of my students at someone cheating on them. And if, you know, you look at country western songs, it happens all the time. You look at why you know, people tend to shoot others that they're married to. It's like normally something like that. Uh, a human spouse can be very violently jealous. Our, our divine spouse, we are the bride of Christ. We are betrothed to him. We worship someone else. How do you think he's going to feel about that? We give ourselves to an idol. Think he likes that? Remember, greed is idolatry. You know, it's not like you have a little image somewhere or icon that you're, you know, kissing or worshiping. <coughs> Uh, God has gone on record as saying, this is my nature. You will suffer. Fear me. And he says, when you get children and grandchildren and grown old in the land and, and you act corruptly, it's like, okay, this is going to happen, and you make the carved image, which I just said, don't do, and you do evil in the sight of the Lord, which I said, don't do, and you provoke him to jealousy and, and to anger, which is really stupid. I mean, why would you want to Poke God until he reacts. When all that happens, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you will utterly perish from the land which you go over the Jordan to possess. This come true? Yup. Northern kingdom went to Assyria and never returned. Southern kingdom went to Babylon and that generation died out and 70 years later the next generation came back. God is serious about our holiness. This is a covenant renewal document, and one of the things they do is they call for witnesses, and it, this happens again at the end of the book. When he finishes it, he calls for the earth and the moon and stars to be witnessed. They'll always be there uh, until he comes back, and uh, there's, he knows what we're doing, and there's going to be witnesses against us. Um, and if you disobey him and are not loyal to him, you will not prolong your good days. You will be utterly destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples. He'll so be few in number. Um, you'll serve you know, these human gods and basically regret it. But in the midst of getting the judgment for our sin, if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek from, with him with all your heart and all your soul. That is incredible mercy and grace. That even after he's warned us not to do the things we shouldn't do, and we go do them anyway, and we suffer the consequences which he promised, he doesn't write us off. He says, if you seek him, if you basically say, oh, what an idiot I've been. God, you know, forgive me. I want to do things your way. 
when you're in distress, when you turn to the Lord and obey his voice, the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not forsake or destroy you. He will not forget the covenant. He will restore you. But you'll be damaged. You will reap the consequences of your actions. So don't do that. So this is a great passage to show that God is jealous and merciful. They go together. For some reason, people only want to remember the merciful part. There's much more emphasis on God being a jealous, consuming fire than there is on him being merciful. Right? So do the stuff that he wants you to do. And if you've blown it, seek him. All right? Uh, one, one of my uh, least favorite characters in the scripture is a guy called Ahab. And uh, it's just so bad. And I'm wondering, why do we have so much a description about how bad this guy in Jezebel is? significant other were. And uh, because at the end, even though he has been horrible, he turns back to God and God forgives him. The funny thing is, is people think, oh good, I can live however I want and I'll see God at the end and everything will be fine. No. You remember Moses lost out on the earthly inheritance? You'll lose out on your spiritual inheritance. God basically says, your, your future inheritance gets burned up, so don't lose it. Plus you might take it by us before you that's true, yeah. Gotta watch out for those buses. <laughs> or a crazy bicycle messenger. Yeah, could be that. All right, so yeah, our God is great, our God is merciful. So why not, like, respond to that as opposed to have to experience the difficulties? All right, I think we're getting to the end here. Our obedience is rooted in the conviction that there is only one God. If you are totally convinced that. There is only one God, everything else falls into place. If you think there's another God, then you will waver and you will, you know, it's like this one God, what he says goes. There's no one who can supersede it. So we are created and we have a God who communicates to us and we have a God who wants this relationship with us. And if we understand that, then why would we go do something else? My, the thought that I frequently have is, the God who created me knows what's best for me. He wove me together in my mother's womb with certain desires, with personality, with certain skills, all that stuff God put together. He's got good works planned for me before I was even created. All I need to do is find out what they are and do them. How do I find out what they are? The scriptures tell me. I start doing that and then other things might follow through from that. Um, to you it was shown, all this great stuff, you know, that you might know that the Lord your God is God. There is no one else besides him. Do you have any other contender? God of money, God of pleasure, God of security, God of designer fashions? No. There is only him. And if we understand that, we will follow him. <coughs> Last thing, God gives us all we need to obey him. Um, he let you hear his voice. Real privilege. It's a privilege that we have the scriptures in a language that we can understand. Though it's sometimes you might have to work at that. It's a privilege that we can gather to talk about the scriptures. These are privileges. God let us hear them. He might instruct you. You heard it. And he wants to express his love to us. Therefore, know, consider it in your heart, God in heaven above, there is no other. Notice how he emphasizes that again. And he brought you out of Egypt with his mighty power, driving out nations mightier than you. The whole previous chapter was about that. So we would learn to trust him, and uh, we have all we need. He will never ask us to do something that we're not supposed to do. Um, therefore, oh, look, last time this shows up. Guard, keep his statutes and his commands, that it might go well with you and your children, that you might prolong your days which the Lord is giving us, or giving them for all time. God wants us to keep these things in our heart. He wants us to do it, and then he can bless us. And if you screw up, seek him, get back on track, and continue on. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God who is gracious, who is good, who loves to bless. Thank you that you have created this world with a plan and purpose. You have revealed that to us, and give us all we need to enter into it. Thank you that you are merciful and you um, will accept back your 
children after they've rebelled against you. Um, thank you that you give us all the grace we need so we don't have to rebel. May we be a people who guard the thing that you give to us, your truth, um, as our most valuable treasure. May we learn it, live it, and love others with it so you might be glorified both in our midst and in eternity. Thanks for our food. Give thanks in Christ's name. Amen.